Brooke's going to come and share our scripture this morning. It's the same as last week, but we're going to do it again with feeling. John 21, Jesus and the miraculous catch a fish. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. When the disciples, or I'm sorry, when the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught, just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if you want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that this, his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would have been written. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Brooke. I don't know if you've picked up on this or not, but I have really, really enjoyed our study of Luke together. I've really enjoyed getting the chance to understand more about what God is calling us to do and be a part of and how we are called and committed to love and care for one another. And I just appreciate the fact that many of you have also reached out and said, like, I, I've enjoyed this as well. I think I've, I've learned a thing or two. And, and as I, I've been studying and reading and sharing with you, I just felt really compelled as we started to go through Easter to, uh, to take a little zig when I was planning to zag and to follow the storyline, what was happening with these early disciples? What was happening and going on? And the more I started reading, the more I realized, we as a church, we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about Peter's story. 
Now, we could take all sorts of time and talk about Jesus, and I want to do that. Obviously, this is a story about Jesus, but this is a story about one of Jesus' followers, the rock, the starting of the church for us, and how does that mean for us? And there's a lot of similarities that happened in the early church from 2,000 years ago that is happening in our church, is happening in our denomination, and is happening across our nation as well in terms of faith. There's a, a faith challenge that's taking place, which is why I think it's good for us to take a challenge for us intentionally to be in prayer together, that there's so much to be had for us doing something together as a community, to study something, to read, to be in prayer together. And so that's why we're focusing on Peter as well. And, and Peter is one of those characters of the Bible. And it's really easy to make him look a little brash, um, a little rash, maybe somebody who fires from the hips, but... He frequently comes across as the person that he is that individual. Out of the 12 disciples, he is probably the most rock star-esque of all of the disciples, right? And from wanting a full bath from Jesus when he was just willing to wash feet, he had the audacity to ask that, to striding out in the garden with a sword and cutting somebody's ear off, right? Getting dressed and jumping into a lake in a cold spring morning, he does all these impetuous things, and he has the audacity to ask some of these questions of Jesus that we would like to ask as well, but we don't have the ability to, and so we're thankful that Peter and the disciples did ask questions, and indeed, we've come to expect such behavior from Peter, but we kind of expect that behavior from ourselves as well, because we are individuals who are seeking questions, and I hope that you understand it's okay to ask those questions what, where, when, why questions of God, that God is big enough. And so if theologically you've ever been taught by somebody not to question your faith or to question God, that is a fallacy. Time and time again, we see that Jesus is asking questions and his disciples are asking questions and that Jesus, as, as a teacher, as a rabbi, he learned in the art of asking questions and that's what rabbis did and that's what people have done across time but when we stop asking questions we stop growing and we want to grow in our faith which brings us to chapter 21 and i think 21 is and john is really an, an interesting chapter for us i i touched on this last week that chapter 20 actually ends the entire book and it really gives us a place where john could have just stopped but then there's chapter 21. And chapter 21 is a gift to us, we being the believers of Jesus Christ, the people who have already taken the leap of faith and have said, I choose to follow you, Jesus. I want to give you my life. And now we ask the question, okay, Jesus, now what? I've given you my life. Are we done? Like, should I expect that I'm going to see heaven now? I mean, when Jesus was hanging on the cross and there was a thief next to him and he just had a little moment of like, I think I know who you are, Jesus. And Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise. I think I've reached that level of faith, right? Aren't we done? Let's all go home, right? Let's all go to Bob Evans. We've done church today. But the truth is, there's a lot more growth that can happen in our lives. That we've been given a gift and we don't want to just put it in our pocket and not share it. We want to share that. And that's why chapter 21 is really important to us as followers of Jesus, that we've chosen to follow Jesus. And so as this story unfolds, Peter remains in the spotlight modeling for us what it means to be the shepherd of a flock of Christ. We've already seen this miraculous story of faith. And faith can be measured in eight feet. That's the distance from one side of the ship to the other side of the ship. The disciples had been fishing all night. They didn't catch a single thing. They didn't catch two fish, three fish, four fish, or a blue fish. They didn't catch any fish. And then Jesus gives them an idea. Hey, why don't you throw the nets over on the other side? Okay. I mean, we've been doing this all night with no success. I don't know why you think throwing the nets eight foot on the other side is going to mean anything, but... When we follow Jesus, even though we sometimes don't have all the understanding of faith or of hope, but when we follow Jesus, that's when we see our nets get filled. The disciples now have not only witnessed the resurrection of Jesus, but they've experienced the Spirit. They've experienced how God moves in our lives. And so they know the truth and they've experienced the Spirit of truth, which is what we want to experience as well. 
It's an important question that lingers over the end of the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What will they do with their lives now? Okay, Jesus, now what? What are we going to do? So they simply prioritize these spiritual moments with Jesus, or will they have these moments lead to somewhere of significance? And so that's why we're thankful for the book of Acts, because it captures what happened in the early church. And I don't know about you, I, I wish I knew even more about what had happened. What happened in this story of faith? What happened in this story of people having the chance to use what God had given them in their understanding and beliefs of faith? And so there's three important things before we jump in today's verses. We're looking at verses 15 through 25. It's the other half of this chapter. So if you want to grab your Bible and flip open to the Gospel of John chapter 21, we're looking at 15 through 25. But three things I want to bring to your attention first. Number one, Jesus didn't need the disciples to bring any fish from the boat that they just caught. I I tried to impress this upon you yesterday, but I really want us to capture this. And I really want you to... Put this in part of your brain. When we think about faith, and we think about what God is calling us to do, and this is bigger than just a a small Sunday school lesson. This is a life lesson that is really easily passed over. But please wrap your head around this. Think, think, Think through this. That Jesus didn't need the disciples to bring any of the fish that he just caught, which was like 153 fish, right? Remember, they went through and counted all the fish. But they had all these fish, and then Jesus says, bring some of your fish up here, even though he's already got a fire, and he's got a fish. He's working on breakfast for them. But he invites them to bring their own fish. Didn't need it. Jesus could have gone, psst, kazam, and there's more fish. Didn't need us to bring our fish. But he invites us. God doesn't need your financial offerings, Right? but he invites you to give it to make kingdom differences. God doesn't need you to go out and share his name with other people, but he invites us to do that. He intentionally wants us to be a part of that community together. There's something to be said about what God is inviting us to do that we lose sight of, that God is inviting us to be a part of that, that we're not looking for somebody else to solve that. And you don't have to go to the seminary or have the degree or be called a pastor or a deacon or somebody who's a faith warrior, but that we are all called to minister to one another. And that Jesus invites all of us to bring something. And we shouldn't minimize it and say that it's not important. Or we shouldn't minimize it and call it a Ford Taurus. But sometimes we do, right? We minimize our faith in our walk. Second thing I want to make sure that we understand before we launch into verses 15 through 25 is that Peter puts on his coat, right? He's out in the boat, he puts on his coat, then he jumps in the water. I don't know if you've ever jumped in the water in early spring. This is just a couple days after Passover, which is around Easter, which means the water is, it's cold. And I don't know if you've ever put on a coat and jumped in the water and swam 300 feet, but it makes it, it makes it harder. I don't know why Peter put on his coat and jumped it out, but he is probably looking for that fire that's on the side there. This is the third point I want to make, and this is about the, the fire as well. The last time we had a major encounter with Peter, he is outside of the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. And he has asked three times, right? Hey, aren't you that guy who knows Jesus? And he denies him three times as he's standing around a fire. And now Peter has this next opportunity to be standing next to a fire, cold, well awake, even though he's been working all night, and now he has this experience with Jesus. This is probably Peter's second encounter with Jesus. We have another remark in Luke that Peter and Jesus did have an interaction, and we don't have that recorded. So this is the second larger vocal encounter that we have between Peter and Jesus, and he's having this private conversation with his friends there. And so he's, uh, he's already had this alone conversation, and now he's having one with all the people he's been fishing with overnight as well. And so the disciples, who are also part of the story, they're aware of what's happening. And so they're seeing Jesus and Peter have this interaction. It's a teaching moment. It's a moment that just kind of popped up, but we're going to learn a lot as a result of it. And so Jesus reinstates Peter, verse 15. and says, well, when they had finished eating, which, by the way, that had to be one of the greatest breakfasts on the face of the earth, right? Who made breakfast for you? It was Jesus. Over a fire. And he had probably the best fish, and he invited me to bring my fish, which means 
I mean, did he make a delineation about whose fish was whose? Was one going to be better than the other, or was it all probably really great? And was it really about the fish? It's probably more about they got to be with their friend, they got to be with their teacher. And so Jesus starts asking questions, and maybe they were having another conversation. It's not recorded. But when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, because they didn't have crazy last names like we do today. They were known by their last name of the region they were from, or son of so-and-so. And he asked the question, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. I don't read Greek very well, and I imagine most of you don't read Greek as well, right? But can I, can I break this down to you in what it meant into the Greek version of the story? Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Agape. It's a Greek word, agapos, which is the highest form of love. This is what's kind of crazy about the word love. We throw it around like it means nothing, or we make, make it mean the most important thing possible. And that's what's crazy about the word love is because it could mean anything. Like, I love this taco. Oh, it's so good. Well, why don't you marry it if you love it so much? Well, it's not that kind of love. I mean, we're going to have a short-term relationship, and 18 hours later, we'll be done with it, right? But what about true love that lasts on and on? What about something grandiose? That's why when we talk about Eskimos. They have so many different words for snow, very careful descriptive words. And the Greek had all these descriptive words about love. But Jesus is asking Peter, do you agape? Do you really, 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 really love me and care for me? Not in a, a physical manner, but do you uphold our, re- our relationship and friendship more than anything else? And then Peter says, Jesus, I fail you. Which means, I about 70% love you. What? Peter's being super honest now. He's done lying, he's done getting caught in things, and he's a little hurt about his relationship with Jesus, and he's trying to figure things out. Do you possess a profound love for me? Jesus asked Peter again, and he says, "Uh, Jesus, I about 70% really love you. I'm I'm into you about 70%. We're, We're really good friends, but we're not the absolute best of friends. Yet. We used to be. We had a falling out. I screwed up. I'm around a fire again. It's very clear to everybody sitting around the fire that I did this already just last week, but I can't commit that I'm so in love with you because I've already done that before and I failed. Do you remember that story where Jesus and his followers are in the upper room? This is Gospel of John. And Jesus says that you, you, my followers, are going to betray me. And Peter says, no, 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 they might But not me, not this guy who's got two thumbs. I love you, Lord. And now Jesus is having this conversation with Peter, asking, do you agape love me? And Peter keeps replying, "Uh, I feel you, love you. We're really close, but we're we're not besties yet anymore. Jesus, I'm really embarrassed. I'm really hurt. And then Jesus asks him a third time if he loves him, but he This is what he really meant. Do you possess a profound love for me? Do you 70% love me, Peter? And Peter replies back, Yes, Lord, I'm I'm really fond of you. That question and answer three times is very telling for us. See, at last Sunday's message, we put the spotlight on this miraculous catch of fish, and no doubt that's a symbol that's well surprising to us that our faith could also be the difference between eight feet, which could be barely anything, or it could be something we're asked to do that's very difficult or hard. But Jesus is still the disciples' champion. He is still on their side. He has defeated sin, and the thing that he could do is he could go up to heaven and be with his father and be done with it, but instead he has returned to help his companions and friends of the last three years understand what they're called to do. But more, he wants to direct their work. He wants to help them with this answering the question of, okay, Jesus, now what? But he wants to be direct to their work as well. And so he helps them find a way that catches beyond their wildest beliefs. 
And this symbol can be applied to the church and its work today. What are we called to shepherd? What are we called to catch? As Jesus worked through the direction of his Father, so too the disciples must work to the world of God. And so he is having this relationship or discussion with us. And so Peter, even though he's acting like he's hurt, he's also learning. And so sometimes we act like, well, I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, so therefore I'm not willing to confront them about something that's difficult. I want to be more like Jesus, which means I want to take naps when I get tired. Okay, maybe you, maybe you latch on to that too. But I also want to speak the truth, even though it may hurt somebody's feelings a little bit. But we need to be truthful. We need to help people in speaking the truth. Verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. Who is that? It's John. Yeah, the disciple who Jesus loved. That's, John wrote this letter, right? And so he doesn't refer to himself as the author, but he calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. And so John inserts himself into this conversation in a unique way. So after he made, very truly, I tell you, this is verse 18, go back just a little bit. But very truly, I tell you that when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But then when you were old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. And then 19, Jesus said to them to indicate the kind of death at which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Well, let me help you understand what that really means. And, and it's there. It's pretty clear, but the line there in 18 where it says, will stretch out your hands. Jesus is making it very clear to Peter. He would have understood this. And today we're like, I don't get it. But I'm going to tell you, if you have to stretch out your hands, it's because you're going to be crucified. This is a colloquialism of the time that we understand today. And now that I tell you that when somebody has to stretch out their hands, they're going to be crucified. So Jesus is telling Peter, there's going to come a day that you're going to be crucified, but it won't be until you're an old man. And that's why when we read the very first 12 chapters of Acts, Peter is so on fire. I'm bulletproof. Nothing's going to kill me. I get to do anything and everything I want in Jesus' name, knowing that I'm not going to die until I'm much older. And then by then it won't matter because I'm so close to glory. Jesus is giving Peter an incredible opportunity for him to know. And I don't know about you, but wouldn't you live your life differently if you knew what that expiration date was? Maybe you would leave it to the absolute fullest. Or maybe you're like, ah, I could take 10 years off and not do anything. I don't know, but we know what Peter did, or we're going to take a look at what Peter had to say. And so that's why it brings us to what John had to say, that Peter turned and saw, he saw John there, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And this is the one who was leaning back against Jesus at the supper as well. But uh, verse 21, when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Peter's worried about what's going to happen to everybody else. Is that a selfish thing, or is he, is he worried about his friends as well? I don't know exactly, but Jesus answers him nonetheless and says, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Well, according to church history, even though it's not in Scripture, we believe that John lived the longest out of all the disciples. And he actually wasn't martyred for his faith. He actually probably died on an island in exile, which that's not a great thing, but he was able to write letters and be able to still be in ministry. 23, because of this, the rumors spread amongst the believers that this disciple would not die. So this is kind of like John's aside here at the end of chapter 21. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, I want him to remain alive until I return. What is it to you? 24, this is the disciple who testifies to tell these things, who wrote them down. And we know that his testimony is true. Why would anybody spend the time to write an entire letter about who Jesus is and how he gave up his life to die for other people, that he involved women in his story, and that he brought all these students together? This is the bad news bears of students, by the way, right? All the disciples were the bad news bears. This was not the A team or the B team or the C team. This is a lower league group of students that he's brought together and he absolutely believes in, even though they have turned their backs against him. They weren't there to stand with him at the cross, but Jesus still believes in them. That's why I have so much hope and faith in scriptures, because it's so unlikely this story would happen. You can't help but look at the story and go, clearly the Holy Spirit was writing this story. Nobody would write this story. That's what makes it so interesting. So please don't discount it. 
if we have people in your life who are like, I, it's, it's really hard to understand. It is. It's absolutely fascinating. It's life-changing when you sit down and read it. You get excited about it, especially when we talk about it as a community or we read about it or we pray about it. That we can feel the Holy Spirit. We can hold the Holy Spirit. So last verse, 25. Jesus did many other things as well. I, I can't wait to hear what those stories were, but probably when I get to heaven, it's not going to matter, right? I, I've heard people say like, yeah, when we're in heaven, come by, the, uh, come by the mansion, we'll have a glass of lemonade, and we'll talk about you know, all the things that we missed. I don't know if it's really going to matter. I, don't know, I, don't, I have no idea. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Either way, Jesus will be there, and that's what I'm so excited about. That's why I'm excited about being in community with you, that Jesus is with us, guiding and directing us. So Jesus did many other things, but if every one of them were written down, which a lot of them were, enough for me to build a faith, maybe you too, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. You also have a book that you're writing, a testimony, a story. And I hope that you share it more than the black licorice that you don't want to eat, right? The most favorable thing that you have to offer to other people, please don't keep it a secret. Don't put it under a bushel. Don't put it under a bowl. John chapter 1 is not the scripture to give to those who don't know Christ. This is the story for us who have already accepted who Jesus Christ is. Chapter 21 is for those of us who have already decided to follow Jesus. We call him our Lord and Savior. And we understand there's a cost. And that there's an incredible value. The greatest value of all. And we're in it for the goal of making disciples. Making a disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. There is no greater calling in our lives than to do that. And Jesus gave us handles on how to do that. He reminded us to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And I think the greatest piece for us to hurdle over that is, do we love ourselves enough as Jesus does? That's not to give ourselves pride or give ourselves a self-confidence that's not realistic. But do we love what God loves and include ourselves in that list? There will be hardships, personally and in the world. And there's going to be struggles that are things that we identify with and others that we see go through those struggles. And we can't just wave a magic wand and make it go away, but Jesus didn't promise us a microwave faith. It's a long game. It's one that needs patience. Peter shows us that the impetuous relationship that he had with Jesus, there was a time and place for that, but there was also a long relationship. And the fact that Jesus is patient with us and patient with Peter should be a reminder to us in our faith. It's the best calling you can have in your life to follow Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for all the reminders that we have in Scripture, for how we're called to live our lives. And so we, we ask you to give us strength for today, for Monday, for Tuesday, all the days that end and why, Lord. Would just give us strength for all the days that we might be reminded that it's so powerful to be a follower of yours. And that we don't seek power for the sake of power, but we seek your power to share with others. Not that it would reside in us alone, but that we could share it. To see others' lives transformed and changed in beautiful and powerful ways. To see healing take place. That our heart already does break for what breaks yours. When we see people in pain, we see people suffering. We want to make that pain go away, but most of all, we... We want to help them experience you. That lasting, loving kindness. Help us to do that today, Lord. To experience you now. And just as when you met with your disciples in that upper room and you had that meal with your followers, you broke bread and you split it and you shared it with people and asked them to have that and be reminded of your body being broken. They didn't understand what that meant, but we do today. And you took a cup during that celebration, and you blessed it, and you asked everybody to partake of it as well. So this morning, we are also going to partake of bread and cup 
be remindful about who you are and what you have in store for us. That you gave and sacrificed your life, your body and your blood on that cross for our sins. That you did nothing to deserve of it, but that you loved us so much that you were willing to take our sins to Calvary. So Lord, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon these elements that we might experience you in a new and powerful way and be reminded that our sins could be left and they will be forgotten. Just like anything that's at the bottom of the ocean, it won't be found again. Help us to leave them far away, Lord. Help us to leave our sins. Help us to live our lives anew in you. We love you, Lord. Amen.